welcome to CIHT Podcasts. Today we are looking at how you make the case for transport. I am with Ivan Vihoff, an economist with the Cambridge Economic Policy Associates. They are an economic and financial policy consulting firm and they provide advice to private companies, government, investors and regulators. So the first question, how do we build the economic case for transport? Ivan, perhaps if you could just explain a bit about how this works. There are many different calls on public funding and the aim in deciding where we should spend our money is to try and identify those schemes that present the largest economic benefits. Typically we calculate a benefit cost ratio and typically we have a hurdle rate, for example, uh, at least 2 or at least 1.5 because that way we, we exclude large numbers of, of less valuable schemes. With transport schemes, the main benefit that is usually identified in most cases, for example, in road schemes and rail schemes, are the user benefits in terms of the time that users will save from having access to this transport. There are standard government methods set out for evaluating this. The Treasury Green Book is a general method for appraising all kinds of investment schemes and WebTAG is the Department of Transport's implementation of the Green Book, giving many useful um, values uh, and methods for when it's specifically a transport scheme. So we see different values of time for different kinds of people travelling both business, commuting and leisure. As well as user time, we take into account other user benefits. For example, when the government was investing in additional trains uh, to relieve the peak load uh, in major cities, one of the most important uh, valuations was the value of being less squashed into heavily loaded trains. As well as the um, user time, we take into account environmental effects such as pollution. We often have specific values we can put on the emission of pollutants and noise. There are other environmental effects, however, which are much harder to benefit. For example, when we consider the case for building the A303 tunnel past Stonehenge, One of the main benefits there is the the heritage value and the landscape value of removing the existing road from the landscape and hiding the road in a tunnel, which is also currently impeding us from widening the road so that it currently makes a large bottleneck. These are much harder to value and sometimes someone might have to make a, a judgment as to what they are worth. For example, the conventional evaluation of the A303 tunnel gave it a a benefit cost ratio of rather less than one, which means that the benefits are less than the costs. Those are only the things that are easy for us to value. It's much harder for us to assess the landscape and heritage value of of such a scheme. Another kind of uh, benefit that sometimes arises is health benefits. For example, uh, when we are evaluating cycling and walking schemes, the main benefits are often health benefits rather than journey time benefits. And in some cases, we have values which enable us to quantify those. Typically, cycling schemes have been shown to have a very high benefit cost ratio, but a difference between them and the typical transport schemes is the benefits are health benefits rather than user time benefits and this can put them in a rather different category when people are trying to decide whether to invest in them and which source of funds they might use in order to promote them. Another area which has been brought much into the fore particularly with schemes like HS2 are the wider economic benefits. These are the hoped for or purported 
um, benefits to the economy in addition to just being able to move people around more or faster, which people hope for. The Department of Transport has a, a system for measuring or quantifying these wider economic benefits divided into three categories, productivity, investment and employment. Can we just focus a little bit more on the wider economic benefits, perhaps sort of explaining that with a story or something about how that actually might work? How the... The, the, the difficulty with wider economic benefits is that often those benefits do not come from one thing alone and particularly not the transport on its own. For example, I often tell the story of um, airports who want to expand thinking they will bring tourists in. But tourists only come if three things are together for them. One is the transport to get there. Another is the tourist infrastructure to house and feed them when they're there. And third and most important is the attraction that brings them to there rather than somewhere else. If those two other things are in place, the, the attraction and the tourist infrastructure, then an investment in transport infrastructure to actually make it easier for tourists to get somewhere will probably be very effective in expanding tourism in that area. But if those other two things are missing, then it won't be. And many other things in, in business and, and life um, are like that as well. You need the other things you need to plan to make the other investments that will make the transport work for the other things in the economy. For example, many towns think that by making it easier to get to that town, that will attract employers into that town. But there are other things that employers need in that town, other aspects of infrastructure, not just the transport infrastructure, the telecommunications infrastructure, for example, or ranges of skills or universities to provide intellectual inputs to their research intensive business. When you bring these things together, then transport might believe something that enables all the rest to work together. This area is very difficult to assess because of a phenomenon known as displacement. When we make an investment or encourage an investment in one place is it an investment that would have been made in another place if it hadn't just been made more attractive to invest here? When we create jobs in one place, are there jobs that would just have been created somewhere else? One of the most important factors is trying to create true productivity gains. For example, if you have a worker population which is poorly connected to job opportunities, they may be taking jobs which are not so valuable. Whereas if you connect them to places where there are more jobs, then that is a real benefit to the economy and not just displacement. One of the main productivity benefits we try and gain through transport investments is agglomeration. This is the phenomenon that when people are brought together closely in one place, whether in terms of um, accommodation or in terms more especially of, um, of, of work locations, there seems to be a productivity gain from the proximity of having those people together. Another factor that we need to be very careful of when making investment decisions is the so-called multiplier effect. People observe that when you make an investment that results in the new economic activity um, by making more purchases in the econo economy locally. We often hear a factory is closing down. It's not just the cost of those jobs. It's the cost of all the other jobs from the things that people would have bought from the income of those jobs and also buying other inputs to that, to that business. This is called a multiplier effect. But a multiplier effect exists whenever you invest anywhere and thus we try to look for things that are over and above the effects of the normal multiplier effect that comes from any kind of local investment. After schemes have been implemented, how do we evaluate the projected benefits and costs that were in the appraisal? It's, it's clearly very important that our appraisals are truthful uh, attempts to predict 
what goes forward. Otherwise, you end up with politicking of people trying to just promote their pet schemes with um, fake appraisals. And, and increasingly, we carry out um, evaluations afterwards to check those appraisals. One of the most common problems is optimism bias. People think the demand will be greater than it actually turns out to be, or people think the scheme will be much cheaper to implement um, than it actually turns out to be. Um, although there are also some cases where demand turns out to be higher than we expected it. On average, it turns out to be lower. So now with highways, um, Highways England, which is responsible for the strategic road network, that's the major motorways and trunk roads, not the local road networks. Highways England now routinely carries out what are known as POPE, uh, P-O-P-E, Post Opening Project Evaluation of all its uh, larger schemes. And it does this twice, once fairly shortly after opening and once further after opening. The first um, Pope will mainly concentrate on whether it was actually delivered at the costs it was predicted at and whether many of the more proximate and easier to assess effects that come immediately, such as environmental effects, are actually as expected. Further on, we will have a, a longer term assessment of the demand for the scheme and whether the traffic is what we expected. Only very recently, the Department of Transport has also been um, required to carry out post-opening post project evaluation. And the first scheme that it evaluated under this new requirement was HS1. Um, the, the high-speed railway from uh, St Pancras to the Channel Tunnel. This was not published with great fanfare because it did actually show that the um, project uh, did not meet the um, standards that would have been required to justify it if we had known it was going to cost that much and if we'd known that um, demand for the use of the rail railway was going to be so limited. Going further back in time, we might look at some of the investments we have made and wonder where we might really have made them if we had known what, how it was really going to turn out. The Channel Tunnel is a key case. The Channel Tunnel came in at twice the cost it was expected and the demand for it was much less than we expected, mainly because between the decision time of building it and it actually opening the phenomenon of low-cost air carriers had become established and people wishing to travel around Europe did so much more in aeroplanes because it was much cheaper to do so. Um, the, the cost overrun on the Channel Tunnel was substantially due to the government changing its requirements in terms of the safety facilities required in the tunnel. Um, and maybe if we'd waited a little bit longer to work out what those safety requirements would be, we'd have known what it would cost to build rather better. We can distinguish here between what you might call normal uncertainty and, and radical uncertainty. Normal uncertainty is something we can think about and imagine what might happen in different circumstances. The cost overrun is normal uncertainty and we could have thought about that more carefully. Um, the low-cost carrier change in the market uh, is what an example of what we can call radical uncertainty, something that's very hard to imagine happening and we can't really even guess what the risk of it might be. The Channel Tunnel is a, is a very special case because it was a very large and risky um, scheme. For more general schemes, people have done studies of how much um, costs tend to come in at in comparison to how much they are forecast originally and we now have parameters we call optimism bias parameters that people are required to add to their costs when appraising schemes to attempt to correct for this optimism bias. So one final area is land use transportation interaction models so how 
transport interfaces with housing, mm. for instance? Yes. So one attempt to try and model wider economic benefits, um, which takes account of the fact that it's more than about just the transport, are so-called land-use transport interaction models, which are increasingly being made use of. There is now a London land-use transport interaction model. Part of transport has recently commissioned a whole England model and also various regional models, though these are still fairly coarse scale models, which attempt to assess the effect that transport has on other things that are going on in the uh, land use area and thus assess the wider economic benefits of transport investments. Nevertheless, this doesn't take away from the fact that transport works alongside other policy schemes to promote economic development and people still need to think about what those other policies are that will have synergies with transport investment to create economic opportunities in particular localities. Thank you for listening to the CHT podcast.